Would you turn back to Acts chapter 8? Look at the last part of verse 21. Peter says to Simon Magus, Thy heart is not right in the sight of God. I've entitled this message, A Heart Not Right. Look in verse 8 of this chapter, and there was great joy in that city. You see, Philip had gone and preached the gospel, and there were many people who believed what they heard. Look in verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. There were many people in this place that believed the gospel. Wherever the Lord is speaking, you can be sure that Satan will be at work as well. Look in verse 9, but there was great joy in that city, but there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, magic, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that he himself was some great one. He appeared great to these people. They were impressed by the things that he did. Uh, somebody says, is there such a thing as that? Well, I reckon there is. The Bible says there is. And I know that Satan himself uses great signs and lying wonders and mighty powers. The scripture says that concerning him. Verse 10, to whom they all gave heed, the people of Samaria, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. Now, they mistook the power of Satan for the power of God. They said, this man has the mighty power of God. And they were very impressed with this man. They thought well of him. Verse 11, and to him they had regard because that for a long time he had bewitched, and that's impressed them with sorceries. They thought highly of this man, but... When they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Now, when they heard the gospel, they forgot Simon Magus. You know why? They heard something better. That's why. They heard something better. Grace is better than works. God's will is better than man's will, isn't it? They heard something better better and they were excited and they forgot Simon Magus hearing the gospel verse 13 then Simon himself believed also and when he was baptized he continued with Philip and wondered beholding the miracles and the signs which were done Simon believed also, this is kind of a divine disclaimer. Here we have an unbelieving or a believing unbeliever is what you call him. Because you see that he didn't really have saving faith. But the scripture says that Simon believed also. It was not real faith. Men and women that really believed, believed because of what they heard. But notice how it says, then Simon himself believed also uh, and when he was baptized, he continued with the Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. That's where his faith came from. He beheld the miracles and the signs, and he was impressed. And I'd be impressed too. I mean, Philip was able to lay his hands on people, and all of a sudden they had miracle working power. They had the ability to heal people, to speak in other languages, to take up snakes and all those things, the scripture says, that comes with this gift of the Holy Spirit. And he saw this and he was impressed. And he believed also. But in saving faith, it was that faith that's based on sight. He believed also. The other people believed because of what they heard. They heard 
the gospel. They heard, but he believed from what he saw. He had the same kind of faith devils have. The scripture says the devils believe and tremble. His faith was not saving faith. Verse 14. Now, don't miss this. Um, Simon Magus heard the truth. He didn't hear a false gospel. He heard Philip preaching Christ. And says he believed. And he continued with the apostles. And he was baptized. He confessed Christ in believers' baptism. And no one had any idea with regard to who this man really was. He was accepted as a believer just like everybody else. Verse 14. Now. When the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now, Philip could lay his hands, I mean, Philip could preach the gospel to them, but he couldn't lay his hands on them so they could receive the Holy Ghost. Why is that? Because only the apostles could do that. Philip couldn't put his hands on them for them to receive the Holy Spirit. Only the apostles could do that. He's, Simon Magus saw the miracles that he did. But let's go on reading. Who when they were come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. Now this is so important. When they saw through the laying on of the apostles' hand the Holy Ghost was given. Philip couldn't transfer these gifts. It only happened through the laying on of the apostles' hands. And that is why all of this charismatic uh, Pentecostal stuff that goes on today is nothing more than phony. Phony. It's only through the laying on of the apostles' hands that the Holy Ghost could be given. And when someone claims these uh, gifts that or given by the Holy Spirit, it's not so. They're lying. They're making things up. They might believe it, but they're making things up. And as far as that goes, if they had the power to heal, why aren't they going to hospitals and healing people? Because they can't do it. They can't do it. It's not real. So this is important. It's through the laying on of the apostles' hands that the Holy Ghost was given. I hope you'll get hold of that, and this will make you see that this entire charismatic stuff is phony. It's foolishness. It's not real. This gift only came through the laying on of the apostles' hands. And Simon saw this, and he was impressed. You know, he'd lost his power with these people. He had some kind of power over them, and now he lost it, and he wants it back. And he says, well, if I have this power to put my hands on people and give them the Holy Spirit, just like the apostles did, so they can start performing these miracles, I'll have some power back. And I want this power. And he didn't realize what he was saying. So he looked and said to Peter, I'll give you money. I'll give you a lot of money if you give me the ability to lay my hands on people so they'll receive the Holy Spirit. I don't think he was expecting the answer he got. Verse 19 or verse 20. Well, verse 18, when Simon saw it through the laying on of the apostles' hand the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. You know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth 
speaking. What the scripture says. And he exposed to Peter what he really believed. That the gift of God could be bought, purchased, earned. Now let me say a a couple of things about the gift of God. The Lord said, if you knew the gift of God. He's talking about himself. He's the gift. If you knew the gift of God and who it was that saith to thee, give me to drink, you would have asked. You wouldn't have offered payment because you would have known there's no way you can buy me. There's no way you can merit me. There's no way you can earn me. The only way you can have me is if I give myself to you. And you would have asked. And he would have given thee living waters. You see, there's no one who asks that he doesn't give to. But if you try to earn, it won't work. Peter spoke here of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Child of God, how dependent upon it are you for the Holy Spirit? You need him to enable you to believe. You need him to give you a new heart. You need him to work repentance in you. You need him to cause you to persevere in the faith. You need him. And to think that he could be earned or merited or purchased. I think of what Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Now, if you have faith, it's not because you decided to believe. If you have faith, it's because he gave you faith. And if you have faith, you know that. You know it didn't come from you or an act of your will. You know it's the gift of God's grace. And would you think something like that could be merited or paid for? If you have it, you know better than that. We read that repentance is called the gift of God. If you change your mind, that's what repentance is. A changed mind, it's because he changed your mind. It's the gift of God. It's not something that you can purchase or merit. Romans 5.15 speaks of the gift by grace. Now grace, listen to me. Grace excludes any effort of salvation by works. It just excludes it. It excludes payment. It excludes merit. It excludes purchasing. We read in Romans 5, 15 also of the free gift. And what an insult to God to think that there's something you could do to merit it. The unspeakable gift of His grace, of His Son, and you think you can pay for it? Romans 5, 17 speaks of the gift of righteousness. Do you know there's not something you do to become righteousness? It's God's gift to you. He gives you the righteousness of His Son for His own glory. There's nothing you do to become righteous. You don't earn this righteousness. You don't purchase this righteousness. You don't merit it. It's the gift, the free gift of God with no strings attached. That's the only way He gives gifts. We read in Ephesians 4, 7 of the gift of Christ. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And you pay for Him? Hebrews 6, 4 speaks of the heavenly gift. And would you or I seek to buy it with something early, earthly? Paul said in 2 Corinthians 9, 15, Now thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. Indescribable gift. And you'd put a price on it and believe yourself able to come up with that price? What presumption Simon Magus demonstrated when he did this? What a high view he had of himself and his own ability to pay. What a low view he had of God that he could take anything he would offer. You see, his heart was not right, was it? Verse 20, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast fought. 
that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray to the Lord for me, that none of these things which you have spoken come upon me. Now, your heart, he says to Simon Magus, this is the issue. This is the issue. Your heart is not right. It's not upright. It's not sincere. God sees this. It's not right in the sight of God, and it's demonstrated by this. You thought that the gift of God could be purchased. Now, repent of this thy wickedness. What was his wickedness? He thought the gift of God could be bought. Repent of this thy wickedness, thinking that the gift of God could be purchased, and pray that this extreme wickedness might be forgiven by God. Perhaps he'll forgive you. Now, let me say this about forgiveness. Forgiveness is in God's hand. It's up to him as to whether or not your sins will be forgiven. Now, let me repeat that. Forgiveness is in God's hand. It's up to him as to whether or not your sins will be forgiven and you'll be in glory or whether you will be passed by as an act of his justice. You know, even in human terms, forgiveness is a sovereign act. In human terms. If you come up to me and say, it's your duty to forgive me. I, if you're a Christian, you'll forgive me of what I've done to you. I'm probably going to bristle a little bit, and you would too. That's not the way forgiveness works, because really, when you do that, you're not asking forgiveness. You're asking for the payment of forgiveness. You need to forgive me. You need, if you're a Christian, you'd forgive me. What's wrong with you? That's, that's not asking forgiveness. That's demanding it by way of entitlement, isn't it? It's not real. But well, when you come into God's presence, you don't say, I believe, now forgive me. I, I've repented, now forgive me. I've done this. No, that's not asking forgiveness. That's bargaining with God, trying to buy something. Forgiveness is in God's sovereign hand. And if I don't see that, I don't know anything about forgiveness. And the only way I'm going to come into his presence is asking, Lord, for Christ's sake, forgive me. For his blood's sake. Because of your grace, forgive me. You're not coming in God bargaining like he was you know the best way I can think of uh, illustrating this is is people's it's very similar to people's natural reaction to election that God chose who would be saved before time began they said that's not fair well what you say by that if you say that is I'm entitled to salvation that's the only thing we're saying this is not right it's not fair God owes me this. Now Peter says, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right before the sight of God. Now Simon's answer is not very promising. And then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which you've spoken come upon me. Now what is meant by a right heart? What is? A heart that's right in the sight of God. Well, first, let's ask the question, what's meant by the heart? You know, we read of the heart in the scriptures hundreds of times. Hundreds of times. And very seldom is it speaking of that muscle that pumps the blood. First time the word heart is used is found in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, where it says, God saw. What God sees is what is. Not what you see and not what I see. What God sees. 
I know that we're all three different people. We're the people we think we are. We're the people others think we are. And we're the people God knows we are. God knows. He sees. And the first time the word heart is mentioned in the scriptures in Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart. That was the first mention. Was only evil continually. That's God's testimony. That's what God saw. Somebody says, well, I've, I've got a good heart. No, you don't. <laughs> I'm sure you don't. Some mother says of her son, he might be an axe murderer, but he's got a good heart. No, he doesn't. <laughs> no, he doesn't. There's no such thing as a good heart. But your heart is your thoughts. Your heart's what you think. Your heart is what you are. It's your will, it's your intellect, it's your affections, it's what you love. Your heart's what you really are. That's what you really are. What others see, that's a show. Your heart is what you really are. It's the whole man. It's the seed of sin. Remember when the Lord said in Matthew chapter 15, out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, theft, false witnesses, blasphemies. These all proceed from the heart. You might not commit these things outwardly, but you do inwardly. The heart is the seat of sin. It's from the heart that all sin comes from. But the heart is also the seat of all true obedience. You've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which delivered you. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. It's the heart that God looks on. Man looketh on the outward appearance. The Lord looketh on the heart. And right now the Lord's looking on my heart. And the Lord's looking on your heart. What does he See, Peter said to Simon Magus, your heart is not right in the sight of God. Now, what is a heart that's right in the sight of God? And know this, God recognizes it. And you know why, why he recognizes it? Because he gave it. If you have a right heart, it's because God himself gave you that right heart. It's a heart that you didn't used to have. He said in Ezekiel 36, 26, a new heart will I give you. Well, I'm awful interested in this. I want this new heart that God gives. You know, preachers say, give Jesus your heart. He doesn't want it. He'll give you a new heart, though. I wouldn't be presenting my heart to him, but I'd say, Lord, give me this new heart. This is the same heart David spoke of when he said, create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Now, that's a creative act of God. How much do your works have to do with the first creation? None. You weren't even around. He didn't consult with you. How much your works have to do with the new creation? None. But I'll tell you what, you can be asking for it. Uh, as a matter of fact, in that same passage of Scripture, when he said, a new heart will I give you, if you go on down reading in that passage of Scripture, it says, I will shall yet be inquired of by the house of Israel to do this for them. If God gives you a new heart, I know this, you're going to be asking for one. Lord, give me this new heart. Give me this heart of faith. Give me this heart that only you give. I like what it's called in Luke 8, 15 when the Lord's giving the uh, parable of the sower. Remember, there were four different kinds of soils. And the good soil is that which received the word with an honest and a good heart. Now, no man's 
heart by nature is honest and good. I've already read uh, Genesis 6, 5, when God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and every imagination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. That's you. That's me. That's the way we are by nature. Only evil nonstop. But you know, it takes a new heart to see that. The only way you're ever going to see that and believe that is if God gives you a new heart. You're going to see. It's only the new heart that recognizes sin. And the Lord himself calls it honest and good. It's honest before God. Self-righteousness is dishonesty before God because that self-righteousness is not really righteous. It, 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 it ain't a bit. It, it's evil. It's, it, and any good thoughts you have of yourself are dishonest. Honest. They're not honest before God. The honest heart owns what it is before God, nothing but sin. It owns that the only righteousness there is is the righteousness of Christ. This is the honest and good heart. And anything that doesn't believe the gospel is not honest and it's not good. It's not real. It's, it's phony. It's, it's not true. This is that broken heart David speaks of when he says a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, thou wilt not despise. What's a broken heart? It can't work. It's broke. It doesn't work. It can't work its way to God. It's, it's unable to. It's broken. A broken and a contrite, smitten heart. Oh God, thou wilt not despise. This is the true heart the writer to the Hebrews wrote of when he said, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Now, what is an evil conscience? Well, it's anything that's not a perfectly right good conscience. What is a good conscience? It's one that never feels guilty. No, that's a seared conscience. That's not a good conscience. That's one that just doesn't work. A good conscience is a conscience that has nothing to feel guilty about. Where are you going to come up with a conscience like that? The blood of Christ, the sprinkling of that evil conscience that makes me know that all God requires of me I have in Christ and I need nothing else. That's the only thing that satisfies my conscience. It's the blood of Christ. It's not because I've done it right. It's because the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. That's the blood of sprinkling. The sprinkling that sprinkles the evil conscience. And that's the true heart. Turn with me to Romans chapter 2 for a moment. I want you to read this with me. Verse 28. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly. Now, understand this. That nation in the Middle East, Israel, that's not a Jew. That's not a Jew. The Bible says this, doesn't it? People make such a big deal of being a Jew, but they're thinking of national Jew. I'm not interested in being a national Jew, but I'm interested in being this kind of Jew. Let's go on reading. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which was outward in the heart. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart. It's not a physical thing. In the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. God praises the true Jew. I want to be one of those people, don't you? Well, what's this thing of having a circumcised heart? Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Paul says in verse 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. The repetition of the gospel to me indeed is not grievous. It's not irksome to do this. It becomes more glorious to me as time goes on. But for you it's safe. Now beware of dogs. He's talking about false prophets. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. He, they say they're the circumcision, but all they are are mutilators. Four, verse three, we are the circumcision. And he gives three marks. And they all go.
go together. And here's what a truly circumcised person does. Someone who has a circumcised heart. We worship God in the spirit. Now this thing of worship is altogether beyond us. And we recognize that the only way we can truly worship God is by the spirit of God. You understand that? You recognize that with regard to yourself? You can't even worship. Don't even know what it means unless God the Holy Spirit causes you to worship. Worship is his gift. Somebody says, well, let's go worship. It doesn't work that way. That's why I never, uh, I never say to somebody, come and worship with us. Come, come here and worship. Come here to the gospel. But the only way me or you are going to worship is by the Spirit of God. And he says, we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit. In God the Holy Spirit. It's a spiritual thing. It's not fleshly. Look what he says next. Here's what folks do who worship God in the Spirit. They rejoice. And that word is literally glory. Boast. They rejoice in Christ Jesus. They don't rejoice in their works. They don't rejoice in their experience. They don't rejoice in the stuff they know. They rejoice in Christ Jesus. All I rejoice in is who he is and what he did. And beloved, I do rejoice in him. I, I rejoice in his way of saving. And here's what folks who rejoice in Christ Jesus do. They have no confidence in the flesh. Now, if you ever worship God in the spirit, you know what you're going to do? You're going to rejoice in Christ Jesus. And if you re rejoice in Christ Jesus, you know what the evidence of that is? You have no confidence in any way in the flesh. Your confidence is only in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that is the circumcised heart. That's the heart that's been pricked by the Spirit of God. You remember on the day of Pentecost, they were pricked in their hearts and said, Men and brethren, what should we do? We're in trouble. Give us some direction. What should we do? This is what the Lord did for Lydia when he opened her heart. Remember whose heart the Lord opened? This is the pure heart the Lord speaks of in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now we read of this heart that's not been corrupted from the simplicity of Christ Jesus. The singleness, the onlyness of Christ. That's what a pure heart does. It looks purely to Christ and nowhere else. It's called a sound heart and an understanding heart, and a fixed heart and a willing heart and a stirred up heart, a burning heart. I love that scripture where the two on the road to Bay said, did not our hearts burn within us while he opened to us the scriptures and showed us the way? Now, this can all be summed up. Here's where we're going to close. Turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. A right heart is a believing heart. That's the summary of all of this. A right heart is a believing heart. What is the evidence of salvation? Faith in Christ. Now, if you can look over your life and say, well, I do this, this, and this, I, I must be saved. You've missed it. You've missed it altogether. That's how serious this thing is. If you could think that you're saved because you do this or you do that, you just missed the gospel. Oh, may the Lord deliver us from that. May he give us hearing ears as we look at this passage of Scripture in closing. Romans 10, beginning in verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now, there are two things that are apparent from that verse of Scripture. Number one, they were not saved. And number two, Paul's heart's desire and prayer to God is that they would be. My heart's desire and prayer to God is that I might be saved and that you might be saved. I want the say, oh, and I know you feel the same way if you're a believer. We're all on the same page. Verse two, he says, for I bear them record 
these Israelites, that they have a zeal of God. They're very religious, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, His righteous character, His righteousness in their damnation, His righteousness in their salvation. They, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and here's what happens when you're ignorant of His righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now he's going to tell us something about what this thing of believing is. I want to be a believer, don't you? I mean, I want to believe the gospel. I want to be somebody who's a believer. That's what I want more than anything else is somebody who's a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to believe on Him. Now, what's this thing of believing all about? Well, He first takes us to what it's not. For Moses describeth the righteousness, which is the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Now, if you want to go for a law of righteousness, here's what you've got to do. You've got to perfectly obey the law in yourself. I don't want to go that direction to you. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And really, it's either all of grace or all of works. No in-between. Verse 6. But the righteousness of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is, bring Christ down from above. Don't say, what can I do to get Christ to come down here and do something for me? Don't say that. Don't think it. There's nothing you can do to get him to do anything. Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. Don't say, what can I do to make his death work for me? Now that summarizes most of what goes on under what's called Christianity. What can I do to get him to come down here and do something for me? Or what can I do to get what he did work for me? Verse 8, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, it's so near even right now. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Thou. If you confess with your mouth, and you'll only confess with your mouth what you really believe in your heart. If you confess something with your mouth that you don't believe in your heart, it's meaningless. It's a disadvantage to you. But if you ever believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you understand why he did it, it's because he made full satisfaction. It's not just believing in the physical resurrection, it's knowing why he was raised. He was raised because God the Father was completely satisfied with what he did. You want to find satisfaction, you only find it in his resurrection. You see, he put away sin. And God was pleased with what he did. Claire's reading Psalm 16, Thou shalt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Well, the reason he didn't see corruption is because he satisfied God. He never went through the process of decay because the moment he died, God said, I'm satisfied with what he did and I'm satisfied with everybody he did it for. If thou shalt believe in thine heart the Lord Jesus. Ain't no believing on Christ without believing he's the Lord. <laughs> he's uh, saying he's the Lord. He's the one whose will's always done. You believe that, that he really is the Lord? Uh, he's everybody's Lord, whether they know it or not. I love, I love that scripture says he's the Lord both of the dead and the living. The dead man dead in sin says, he's not my Lord. Yeah, he is. Yeah, you might not know it, but he is. You're in his hand. You're under his thumb. You're in his control. He's the Lord of the dead. And oh, how he's the Lord of the living. He's my Lord. He's my Lord. He's my Lord. If thou shalt confess with my, thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Look at verse 10. For with the heart 
Man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. With the heart man believeth. Now what does that mean? And this is, very, this is an important distinction. What does it mean to believe with your heart? Because if you don't believe with your heart, you don't believe, period. The heart, first of all, this is the heart that God gives in the new birth. Let's get that straight. This is the heart God gives in the new birth. Because the natural heart does not believe and cannot believe. It's the new heart that God gives that believes. And the heart is made of the intellect, the emotions, feelings, and the will. That's the whole man. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Now what that means is, is intellectually, I get this, the only righteousness I have is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I, I get it. I don't have any personal righteousness. My righteousness is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I believe that intellectually. But not only do I believe it intellectually, I love having only his righteousness. That's what, that's what moves my affection. That's what moved my heart. To be saved by his righteousness. Oh, I love being saved by his righteousness. I'm right there with Paul when he said, Oh, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faithfulness of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. I love being saved by his righteousness. And what about the will? What about the will? It's real easy. If you give me a choice between being saved by my righteousness or his righteousness, which one do you think I'm choosing? It's not hard to, not hard to come up with that. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Now, it was said of David, he was a man after God's own heart. Lord, make me that. Lord, make everybody in this room that. Let's pray. Lord, we confess that apart from your grace, our hearts will be wrong. We'll be just like Simon Magus, thinking the gift of God can be bought, and we'll try to purchase and earn your favor. Lord, deliver us from that. Deliver us from our own works. Deliver us from our own understanding. Give us this heart that's right in thy sight. The great work of your grace. Give us this believing heart. Lord, say to each one of us by your Spirit, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Bless the word for Christ's sake. In his name we pray. Amen. Dwayne, come and listen closing in, please.